Bible read chapter by chapter, verse by verse. All right, Shabbat Shalom again, everyone. And uh, beautiful study so far today. And uh, I pray that we'll continue to really see <clears throat> who is showing us specifically by way of instruction as we continue to go through tour. And um, today we're in Deuteronomy chapter nine. And uh, <clears throat> before we get started, we should definitely have a word of prayer. Uh, Brother Brother Rick, are you, you there? I am. Hallelujah. Precious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for all that you've done this day already. We thank you for what you continue to do in our lives, and we just thank you for another opportunity to, to come together and to dig into your word, and to surrender ourselves to you and allow you to teach us, to sh show us what we need to know. So as always, Father, we heed to you a leading of your Ruach to teach us, to guide us, to direct us. And we ask for your anointing upon Brother Rod as he leads this study. Father, we just ask that you'll move us and stir us and that your will is fulfilled in us this day. As always, we give you the honor, honor and esteem. It's only due to you and you alone. Hallelujah. Barak, the name of Yahuwah. Amen. Praise God. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, Brother Rick. Um, so we're, we're now in um, chapter nine of the book of Deuteronomy by way of review, um, uh, Israel on the edge, on the cusp of the promised land and, and Yahuwah last week was urging um, through Moshe for, for them to remember Yahuwah, and we looked at the, those words, remember, forget, and we saw that it meant, it meant to put aside, to no longer have in the forefront of your mind. Not, not that it's completely out of your mind, but that you put something else in front of it and, you know, urging them as they go into the promised land not to forget who Yahuwah is and what he has done for them. Um, and it seems to be you know, a regurgitation of all that Yahuwah has taken them through, uh, not only them personally, but more importantly, their fathers, you know, meaning in the generations before them and all that they went through. And, you know, in, in, in lieu of and in light of him telling them not to forget who he is, we now move into chapter nine, where he's starting to talk about when they did forget, when they did rebel, when they did not remember, um, to give them a history of where he brought them from and what he brought them through and the pitfalls and the traps and the snares that they fell into. And, and, and you, you all know, as we continue on through scripture, all throughout the prophets and the writings, <laughs> Israel has to continually be told to remember not to go back, not to go back down the path that got them in the place of rebellion, of, of following uh, the ways of the other nations, of being idolizers, not trusting in Yah, but trusting in men. Isaiah chapter 30, you know, which we went through um, in a different study, you know, they were going to, 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 the, to, the, to the other nations uh, uh, to make treaties rather than going to Yah. You know, so this is a consistent thing um, that they have to be reminded about, not trusting in who, who Yah is, what he's done, <clears throat> and specifically who he is to them, and calling out <clears throat> them as a people 
and considering them as a people. You know, um, one of the things that we, we're going to look at is that he, you know, looks at his people and he considers them. You know, he's mindful of them. Uh, and just really understanding what that means is something that's necessary um, because we have to clearly see that he looks at us the same way, those who, of us who trust believe and have faith in him and live by his word. Um, because if he would forget them, then he could easily forget us. And because there's a track record of him remembering, of him holding to his promises, we can believe those exact same things. We don't have to worry. We don't have to fret. We don't have to lose our minds. We don't have to get discombobulated when the rest of the world is because we have a righteous and holy little Yahuwah who considers us who keeps us in the forefront of his mind, who loves us and will provide and take care of us. So with that in mind, let's kind of look at what chapter nine is saying. Um, I wanna ch chop off 10 verses at a time um, so we can you know, clearly get into what, it, what we're being reminded of. Now, a lot of this is going to be you know, something we've gone through but just as the Israelites, we need to be reminded of these things as well. We need to go through them as well, repetitively. Um, so, um, who will be my first reader today? We'll read the first 10 verses, verse 1 to verse through verse 10. Uh, Brother Dean and Carmen have their hands up first. You can take yeah, that. That was really fast. I didn't even get a chance to put my hand up. <laughs> All right, Brother Dean and Carmen. You have the floor. Brother Dean, brother, Sister Carmen. Oh, all right. I have to unmute you. Hold on. Hallelujah. Thank you. Oh, I muted them again. <laughs> what happened? Oh, here comes Jim. Hallelujah. We, we in? We to do. Got you now. You're good. Yeah. Go ahead, brother. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay. Hallelujah. Here, O Yasharel, you are to pass over the Yarden this day to go into possess nations greater and mightier than yourself, cities great and fenced up to heaven, a people great and tall, the children of the Anadim, whom you know and of whom you have heard say, who can stand before the children of Anak? Understand therefore this day that Yahuwah Elohim is he which goes over before you as a consuming fire, he shall destroy them and he shall bring them down before your face. So shall you drive them out and destroy them quickly as Yahuwah has said unto you. Speak not in your heart after that Yahuwah Elohim has cast them out from before you saying, for my righteousness, Yahuwah has brought me in to possess this land. But for the wickedness of these nations, Yahuwah drives them out from before you. Not for your righteousness or for the uprightness of your heart. Do not go to possess their land. But for the wickedness of these nations, Yahuwah Elohim drives them out from before you. And that he may perform the word which Yahuwah swore seven oaths unto your fathers, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Understand therefore that Yahuwah Elohim gives you not this good land to possess it for your righteousness, for you are a stiff-necked people. Remember and forget not how you provoked Yahuwah Elohim to wrath in the wilderness from the day you did depart out of the land of Mizraim. Until ye came unto this place, ye have been rebellious against Yahuwah. Also in Chorev, ye provoked Yahuwah to wrath, so that Yahuwah was angry with you to have destroyed you. 
when I was gone up into the mount to receive the sapphire stones, even the sapphires of the covenant which Yahuwah cut with you, then I abode in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. I neither did eat bread nor drink water. And Yahuwah delivered unto me two sapphire stones written with the finger of Elohim. And on them was written according to all the words which Yahuwah spoke with you in the mount of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Praise Yah, brother. Um, what do you see that uh, stands out to you that you want to speak on? A couple of things. Um, um, I, I, I did read before I came on. I, I have to confess. Um, <laughs> so just a couple of things. Um, in the, that I said, uh, in the verse one, I felt, feel that Yahuwah is telling his people that nations will know them and their Elohim as mighty, um, but they have to have faith in the Elohim of impossible obstacles and circumstances. Um, this was for, in reference to verse one. Um, and then in three, um, where it says, um, and you shall know today that Yahuwah, your Elohim, who is passing over you, um, this one, know, know the authority of Yahuwah and testify to the amazing things that he has done so that generations will speak of his power. Because um, what's happening is that the other people are testifying and spreading rumors about how great, you know, th th their gods are. And this is what, you know, is, is uh, Yahuwah is saying, don't let that be the case. Don't, don't let these people's testimony be greater and louder than, than, than ours. You know, that, 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 that's, that's what I get from that. Um, and I'll just say one more. I can say more things, but I'll just leave some space. Um, and also this thing about do not think in verse four, do not think in your heart, you know, um, after Yahuwah, your Elohim, has driven them out before saying, because it was my righteousness. Um, I think it's one of those things that we need to be careful that when we experience victories, um, that, you know, um, the word says victory is, is, is mine, saith Yahuwah. And we just need to be careful that when we receive victories that we don't think that because we are uh, privileged or because we are favored or because we are his own, that it's an excuse um, for self-boasting, you know, at no point at all points we should be in a place of repentance because even they who are experiencing this uh victory it is not because of their works it's because of the promise as the word says that was with their forefathers um so we just need to be careful not to get too excited about the victories and, and know that um yeah you know it, the victories still are being given to or shared with a stiff-necked people so we can still be stiff-necked while experiencing victory. So, hallelujah. Interesting um, insights. I, I, I agree with the majority of them. Um, we'll talk about the stiff neck thing though, you know, in a minute. But uh, I, I, I like your insights um, uh, and, and, and what you were able to assess uh, specifically in verse four. I, I like that and we'll talk about that more as well. Um, does anyone else want to share anything about the first 10 verses before I start to? Okay, Sister Shane, too. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Um, I just have a general question, and I apologize for my lack of knowledge. Um, when, uh, where was it? Okay, so verse, chapter 9, verse 2 where it says, a people great and tall, the children of the Anakims. I was doing some research um, on the Anakims and practically it just came back that they're giants. And I remembered when we were going through the Genesis studies, um, I think it was Brother Jadiel that says that the word Nephilim also means giant. So I'm thinking that there are descendants of the Nephilims, but in a state like that, like, why would they call one set Nephilims and then call one set Anakims? Is there, are there like a different breed of giants or so forth? I'm, I'm just curious on that. Well, there were different, there were different um, 
uh, nations that uh, were synonymous with having tall men of stature. Um, the Anakims were um, who the Israelites defeated, you know, going through uh, the book of Numbers. Um, we went through that extensively. Um, but Yahuwah is drawing their attention to remember um, because they were, you know, viewing these people as, as large and huge and uh, compared to them, they were grasshoppers. And, 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 and when the spies went out, only Joshua and Caleb came back and said, no, we, we can do this thing. You know, and Yahuwah said, mm -hmm. with my strength, with my power, uh, you can defeat all, all of these people. And the point was to draw their attention to Yahuwah's promise, which uh, Dean touched on that we see going through verses four, five, and six, and we'll talk about that. Um, but it starts off in verse one, and, and this is something that I want us to really grasp. Um, and I think a lot of people miss what Yahuwah is saying when he says, hear, O Israel. And, you know, there's a calling here uh, to listen. There's a calling here uh, for Israel to hear something uh, that was distinctly different from what the other nations had, right? Yahuwah is speaking to a people. The, the Elohim that made the heavens and the earth is speaking to a specific people. He's calling us <clears throat> to bend our ear, lean forward, lean in, and listen to what he has to say, but to also do the things he has to say, right? Because it's in direct contrast with the other nations that are around them that can see what they've carved with their hands and propped up as an Elohim, but they can't hear it. And, and here the Israelites can hear what their Elohim is saying, but they can't see him. Um, clarification, let's turn to uh, Psalms chapter 115 and I'll. Um, Maybe I'll have someone else read, so we're not always hearing my voice, but Psalm 115, let's look at a couple verses. Um, <clears throat> Let's start in verse one. Who wants to read? Somebody has their hand raised. Sheena, June, they... You guys want to read? Somebody, is your hand raised to read? <laughs> My hand's raised to read. I'll let um, Sheena read if she would like. Okay. Thank you. All right, start in verse one. Um, And read, uh, stop it, stop at 14, read through 13, one through 13. Okay. Not to us, O Yahuwah, not to us, but to your name give esteem, for your kindness, for your truth. Why should the Gentiles say, where now is their Elohim? But our Elohim is in the Shemaim. Whatever pleased him, he has done. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. They have noses, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. They have feet, but they do not walk. They make no sound through their throat. The ones who make them shall become like them. All who trust in them. O Israel, trust in Yahuwah. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in Yahuwah. He is their help and their shield. You who are there, Yahuwah, trust in Yahuwah. He is their help and their shield. Yahuwah has remembered us. He barak us. He barak the house of Israel. He barak the house of Aaron. He barak those who reveal Yahuwah, the small and the great. Praise Yah. Is that not clear? Look, those, <laughs> what does it say? Those who make them are like them. They become like them. Those that trust in something uh, with their eyes to, to worship an idol that has no eyes eventually we'll become blind. 
that trust in an idol that they built with their hands that has ears, but the ears cannot hear will eventually not be able to hear truth. You know, and, and we see these things. They won't be able to smell. They won't be able to handle all of these things. They won't be able to walk in regards to understanding what is true and what is false. And they will be consist consistently cut off from even having a mind that operates a mind. Remember we talked about reprobate. He turns their mind to a reprobate mind, meaning a dysfunctional mind, meaning an a, a, a insane mind. The idea of a, of, of a reprobate mind from the Greek context in, in, in the Greek vernacular uh, means literally to, that the brain is detached from its brain stem, meaning it's not functioning as an actual brain should function. That's what the people that follow idols, false Elohims become. And, and we need to understand that this is what Yahuwah is saying to us when he says, listen to me versus listen uh, to those in the nations that are around you and that surround you. Um, he says that, 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 that they are mindful, that, that he is mindful of us, verse 12. Yahuwah has been mindful of us, meaning that he takes thought in us. He considers us. He cares for us. You know, this is a unique place to be, and he's calling us to hear and do because of all these things. You know, you know, our problem is that we 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 know the word. <laughs> we read the word. We can see the word. We can tell tell it upside down, flips, bobs, and weaves. We can dice it up, slice it up. But when it comes to doing, that's what where we lack. We don't lack for knowing, we lack for doing. But here, O Israel, calls for us to hear and do. Be a, be a product of what my instructions are so that my instructions are clearly seen through your actions, <laughs> through the way that you act, through the way that you operate, through your behavior. You know, my law can be seen on the edge of your lips, on the tips of your fingers, at the very tips of your toes, because you walk, you talk, you move, and you have motion like me. This is what he's saying when he says, hear, O Israel, and everything that follows. You know, you know, rehearse. Let me rehearse what happened at Kadesh Barnea, you know, in order of erasing all of the, the, the mistakes that you made, erasing even all of the excuses that you might have to not do. He mentions the giants so that they wouldn't forget that he was able to defeat them, right? But he's telling this to this new generation of something that happened before them so they don't, too, follow that same track. Praise God. Man, you know, and uh, there's so much in here. There's so much in here. Verse 3, um, I believe uh, 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 Brother Dean brought this out. He says, it says this, it says, therefore, understand today that Yahuwah, your Elohim, is he who goes before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and bring them <clears throat> down before you, speaking of the Anakim, right? So you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly, as Yahuwah has said to you. And understanding this. That wisdom from, from Yahuwah, wisdom from him, understanding begins with our confession, you know, of dependence on him. Like the moment we confess our dependence on him is the moment that wisdom is born. The fear of Yahuwah, understanding who he, who he is, the reverence is the beginning of all wisdom, Solomon says in the Proverbs. Here is no different. And this is exactly what he's telling us. You know, I like what Brother Dean brought out as far as, you know, verse four. He says, do not think in your heart after your Elohim, uh, Yahuwah Elohim has cast them down before you because of my righteousness. Don't, you know, we're not to start thinking, look, Yahuwah choose, chose me because I'm righteous. And we walk around with that moniker. No, he's telling them right here why he chose them. One because of the immorality of the Amorites. He told us that back in Genesis chapter 15, right? The, 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 the iniquity of the, 
the Amorites has not yet come to full. And two, the promises he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let's look at Genesis 15 real quick. Um, it says this. You guys with me so far? Thumbs up. Because you're quiet. I got to check to make sure y'all with me here. All right, praise God. Genesis 15. Give me a reader. Um, I want to look at verses. Let me see. Genesis 15. Let's read from. Um, Let's read from uh, start in verse 12 and let's read to verse 21. Go ahead, June. Genesis chapter 15, verses 12 through 21. This is what he's referring to in regards to his promise. All right, verse 12 to 21. Yes. And it came to be when the sun was going down and a deep sleep fell upon Abram, that see, a frightening great darkness fell upon him. And he said to Abram, know for certain that your seed are to be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. But the nation whom they serve, I am going to judge. And afterward, let them come out with great possessions. Now, as for you, you are to go to your fathers in Shalom. You are to be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation, they shall return here for the crookedness of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to be when the sun went down and it was dark that see a smoking oven and a burning torch passing between those pieces. On the same day, Yahuwah made a covenant with Abram saying, I have given this land to your seed from the river of Mish Misraim to the great river, the river Euphrates with the Kenite and the Kazanite and the Kadmonite and the Hittite and the Pezrite and the Raphim and the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Jagasite and the Yishbrite. Praise God. <laughs> those names can be, those names. ISR has the Hebrew <laughs> version. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, those, those names can be difficult, but so we clearly see that we clearly see um, the promise, uh, and this promise was, you know, repeated, regurgitated, I should say, repeatedly to Isaac and Jacob as well. Um, but but the, the, the two things that stand out is that Yah doesn't measure time by minutes and days; He measures time by immorality. Still. He's returning when the when the immorality rises to the days of Noah, right? That's when he's returning, right? So look at what he says, you know, in 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 verse 16. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Immorality of the inhabitants is the first reason that he's pushing them out. The second reason that he's giving it to them is because of the promise he made, not because of their righteousness, not because they did anything special. And he wants them to understand this. Because remember, we're coming off of chapter eight, where he was telling them, look, you're going to get into the land and you're no longer going to see the water coming out of the rocks or the manna coming out of the sky or the quail falling down on the land. You know, you're going to be digging your own crops. You're going to be receiving from the water that is already there. Don't 
look at those things and think because you don't see my supernatural hand that my supernatural hand is not still yet there to be seen and start thinking that I have all these things because of the work that I've done. He's saying the same thing here. Do not think in your heart, verse four, after your or Yahuwah, your Elohim, has cast them out before you because of my righteousness that Yahuwah has brought me in to possess the land, but it is because of the wickedness of the nations that Yahuwah is driving them out from before you. It is not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart that you go in to possess the land, but because of the wickedness of the nations that Yahuwah your Elohim drives out from before you and that he may fulfill, watch this, word which Yahuwah swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we see that, that's what we just read in, um, in uh, Genesis chapter 15. So I just wanted to kind of bring that um, to the forefront of our minds and understanding what he is saying to them in reviewing the history of their rebellions and their falling away from Yahuwah. Um, praise God. Brother Brian and then Brother Charles. Yes, you know. Uh, yeah, I would I don't know if you can confirm this, Brother Rock. I know you study history and stuff like that, but I uh, it's interesting when you, you reference the Genesis 15 with that covenant that God uh, made with Abraham and the significance of uh, the animals and and his, his walking in the midst of those animals, and because I've I've heard before, like the seriousness of that of that um, ritual, and during those times of it's like when you seriously making a covenant, a blood covenant with someone, you are basically saying that you are giving your solemn. It's like making a vow. You're saying if I break this this vow. I'm going to become like just like these animals. I will no longer. I will cease to exist. And and and, and so because I don't know with us being in the Western mindset, and we deal with like contract law and stuff like that, we don't really. A lot of times it go maybe go, go over our head. What yeah. just what took place between Yahuwah and Abraham and the seriousness, the dead seriousness of what what happened there, and it gives like. And uh, it reminds me of what what was stated in uh, in Psalms one thirty eight two, where it says, uh, "I will worship toward thy holy temple, and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name." And and how y'all, yeah, he's he's committed like wholeheartedly, like he's like basically he's basically saying like if I don't fulfill this. I no longer exist. It's like it's it's just amazing you know, how we could put that we could put that have that confidence in him and, and stuff. And it's like it's uh yeah, it's just mind blowing. It's like how he's he's committed to us so much in that way that he was willing, he made that covenant with Abraham and he and he and he followed through with it to this day, throughout time and uh to the end. And uh, and we can have that confidence in him that when we when we uh, truly when we submit to his word and stuff, his word does not return void uh, in anything that um, that we uh, as, as long as we are following his word, we submit to him and, and, and we walk in the truth. He's there for us in that way. So, um, but yeah, it's shalom. Yeah. Absolutely, Brian. Very very good point. Covenants are made in blood. Absolutely, and you know, to breaking of a covenant, as we see um, in the instructions, you know, literally in the Ten Commandments, breaking that covenant is death. So very good visual uh, compilation that you shared in regards to the covenant. And, and remember, you know, where, where Yahuwah talks about oaths, don't, don't make an oath frivolously. You know, don't bind yourself to something that he hasn't called you to do, because an oath is voluntary voluntarily done. And in regards to that, in that same way, remember when they made oaths and promises to one another, they would place their hand on their inner thigh. Now, inner thigh is, you know, G-rated. Literally, they're putting hands on jewels and saying, if I break this oath I'm making with you, may this no longer work, you know what I mean? Which was, you know, your manhood, you know? So 
these these are things that are binding and things that are uh, promises that are are kept in blood. The oath is made in blood. The oath's promise is made in blood. We have Yahushua keeping the promise for our salvation on a tree by his blood. Praise Yah. Um, man, very good point, uh, uh, Brian. Very good point. Glad you pulled that out. Thank you, man. Um, Brother Charles. Yeah, praise y'all. Um, Shabbat Shalom. Yeah, um, speaking of covenants and breaking and stuff, um, yeah, when you all mentioned the the, um, the statues, they have eyes to see what they can't see, you know, ears, to what they can't hear and stuff like that. And um, in my own little mind, you know, it, it brought me to First Samuel, right? First Samuel 5. And I want to read a couple of verses so you can get what I'm trying to say. Praise and it God. says... Um, First Samuel, verse five, verse three, four, and then I'm going to five. But it says, verse three, it says, and when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was Dagon falling on his face to the earth before the ark of Yahuwah. So they took Dagon and set it in its place again. And when they arose early the next morning, there was Dagon falling on his face to the ground before the ark of Yahuwah. The head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were broken off on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso was left of it. So when you look at this in my own little mind, it's like his face fell down. He can't turn his face to look at you to, to see 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 what you need. His his palms is broken off, so his arms and hands can't reach out to save you. You know what I'm saying? And and it said his torso is laid on the ground. Now we know the father's righteousness, his 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 righteousness, his presence of his righteousness broke the um the um the statue. So you can't see the father's hand in this, but you know it's there. And you can't see the father, but it caused it to break. You know, and then another thing I was thinking of is torso was laying on the ground, right? And that's the core of, of the statue. It can't erect itself for correction. It can't correct nothing. So get up. It's like the father saying, I'm going to show you. Ask him to get up. Can't get up. You can make as many statues as you want. You can't get up. And I'm the only one that can um, get you out of this. And also, this is verse 5 real quick. Therefore, neither the priest of Dagon nor who come into Dagon's house thread on the threshold of Dagon's Asdod but the hand of Yahuwah was heavy on the people. So it lets you know right there. Though you didn't see his hand, his hand was there. And if you read on, the rest of them knew that this was real. They ain't have to, you know, they ain't have to go through all that. They know it was real because they, they all dealt with it. And we're going to see throughout the whole Bible, all the nations, this is why they hate his people because they see that he keep putting out his hand. So um, I made a butcher this a little bit. Praise God. Nah, man, don't, don't, yeah, don't, um, you know, you do that a lot, man. You, you kind of downplay, you know, your insight, brother, you, you bring out some beautiful illustrations. That connection was, was awesome. And here's why, you know, we are, are understanding, you know, all the imagery that the Bible gives us, you know, when we're able to make the connections between the books, we're able to confirm that the books are testifying for one another. You know, your 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 uh, enlightenment about what's going on in Samuel with Dagon is a clear picture of him saying to Moshe, "Well, who do I say sent me? Who do I say?" And he says, "I am that I am," meaning I am the only. I am the one that exists. You know, there are no others. No others stand before me. No others are in my presence. Like that's illuminating to understanding that thought. So brother, man, it, that wasn't butchered. If it was butchers, it was precisely butchered and perfectly wrapped, you know, to be cooked on the grill. You know what I mean, brother? So, so, hey, man, you know, don't downplay what you're sharing, man. You know, sometimes, you know, we're, we're not connecting in our minds 
it, some things may not be convoluted, but you, you, you bring out some beautiful illustrations, man. You know, specifically, you know, I'm reminded of your, uh, your electricity analogies and, and how that plays in. And, you know, um, we even just did a, a short, June did a short of, uh, of, of, of a passage. We were going through a numbers and the image she uses, used and, and the things that I said came right from something you said in, in using the illustration of a substation and electric power and how it works in order to get a point across to say that Yah's word only works if you do exactly what it says, just like a circuit. You can't put a circuit upside down and think it's gonna work. It's called a short. No electricity is getting through, you know? So, man, don't don't play downplay yourself, brother. You, you, you bring a lot to the table, man. You know, praise Yah, and everybody knows it. Um, but yeah, picking up where uh, where Brother Charles left off, verse five, you know, he's saying, you know, this is a warning. Don't misinterpret, you know, my grace. Don't, don't you know, my grace is sufficient for you. You are made perfect. I, I make you perfect in your weakness. Listen, <laughs> I'm giving you this land not because of anything that you've done. You know, one of the things that we talked about going through numbers because we talked about it being the book of battle, the book of warfare. And we saw how that was literally, figuratively and spiritually. That same thing applies to us. And for them, their primary victories weren't won on the battlefield. The battlefield was the secondary victory. What was the first victory? The primary victory was praying to Yah. We saw that illustrated in Aaron and Hur holding up Moses' hands. And as he prayed, they were winning. That's the primary victory, seeking him. Secondary victory was on on the battlefield, you know. The secondary losses, you know, are on the battlefield. The primary loss, the primary failure, is not seeking his counsel, going on and doing things without his direction, it's doing something or putting yourself in a place that he didn't call you to be. That's the primary failure. The secondary failure is what actually happens, you know. The book of Numbers, they said, was written so that you, the children of Israel, would know how to do war. And war is won first by seeking him. War is lost first by not seeking him. So we have to have, to have that in the forefront of our minds. Um, verse 6, Brother Dean brought this out, stiff-necked. And, 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 you know, one of the things that he said is that you know, he gives us blessings even though we're stiff-necked. I think he gives us blessings in spite of us being stiff-necked, but, but not necessarily continually because to be stiff-necked is to be, as we look through scripture, historically, Israel is known for grumbling, is known for complaining, is known for disobeying, you know, Moses warns them not to be entitled or not to look at themselves as being entitled versus off of anything other than his grace. Because if, if we get to the point where we feel entitled, where we feel like we got this thing all together, our history is brought up. We're grumblers at best. We're complainers at best. We disobey at best without him. You know. And that's what he is calling them to do and in, in, in calling them stiff-necked is to recognize all of the areas. And he runs through them. This is why he's going through all of these accounts, because he's showing them where they were stiff-necked, where they were disobedient, where they complained, and where they uh, were being um, grumblers. Um, so we're going to start to read these things in the next couple verses. Um, he tells them to remember, you know, how vulnerable they were they were to apostasy, how were they how vulnerable they were to abandoning uh, his word, or you know, just to just to renunciate the their faith, you know. The reason he showed them uh, uh, Kadesh Barnea was so that they would see and remember what happened 
when they ran across the Anakites, right? That they got afraid and that they started to, to have faith in their own minds and follow what they what they were thinking and think that they were grasshoppers, right? What happened? They they for disobedience, for giving them back a false report, they died. Like there's seriousness in it. What Brian said, you know, breaking the covenant, breaking the oath, falling against Yah. You know, that causes those to get swallowed up by the earth. This is serious business. And Moses is warning them here how vulnerable they are to doing these same things. Apostasy is what is what it's called. It means to abandon or to, to uh, just um, renunciate all of the things, all of the promises that Yahuwah has given them. Um, verse 8. Uh, he picks up and um, it says, also in Horeb, you provoke Yahuwah to wrath so that Yahuwah was angry enough with you to have you destroyed. When I went up to the mountain um, to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant, which Yahuwah made with you, then I stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights I neither ate bread nor drank. I'm up there, you know, totally dedicating myself to Yah. You know, I'm being supernaturally satisfied. It says says that, you know, um, science, science med, med, the medical, you know, instructions say that a body can't go without water for, you know, for more than three days. You know, a lot of fasts, even long fasts, they at least have water. Moses went without. That's supernaturally being nourished by Yah for 40 days and 40 nights. I go up there and you guys are down here doing your own thing. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But Horeb is where the golden calf came out. So we kind of stop there um, and we can pick up and read the next 10 verses. I believe that uh, Sister um, Kala was next if she wants to read from verse 10. Through verse 20, are you still with us, Kala? I don't see her. Yes. Uh, okay, I see you. One moment. Sure. Um, verse, so you'll be going from verse 11 to um, yeah, verse 11 to ver through verse 20. 20, all right. Let me just read. All right. And it came to, oops, hold on. I just got this. And it came to be at the end of 40 days and 40 nights that Yahuwah gave me the two tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant. Then Yahuwah said to me, Arise, go down quickly from here, for your people whom you brought out of Mitzvahim have acted corruptly. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded image. And Yahuwah spoke to me, saying, I have seen this people, and look, they are a stiff necked people. Leave me alone so that I destroy them and blot out their name from under the Shamayim and make of you a nation stronger and greater than they. So I turned and I came down from the mountain and the mountain burned with fire and the two tablets of the covenant were in my two hands. And I looked and saw that you had sinned against Yahuwah, your Alawah, and had made for yourselves a molded calf. You had quickly turned aside from the way which Yahuwah had commanded you. And I took the two tablets and threw them out of my two hands and broke them before your eyes. And I fell down before Yahuwah as at the first 40 days and 40 nights. I did not eat bread and I did not drink water because of all of your sins which you committed in doing evil in the eyes of Yahuwah to provoke him. 
for I was afraid of the displeasure and rage with which Yahuwah was wroth with you to destroy you. But Yahuwah listened to me that time once more. And Yahuwah was very enraged with Aharon to destroy him. So I prayed for Aharon at that time also. Praise Yah. <clears throat> you want to pull out anything there? One thing that really sticks out to me, um, I believe it's in the last like two verses, it's a real marker of Yahuwah's mercy for mm. us. The fact that Yahuwah is at the point of destroying us, but he allows someone to even petition him. He allowed Moshe to come to him on behalf of Yasharal, come to him on behalf of his brother Aharon and pray for him and say, look, I, you know, I understand they're wilding, but you could just give them another chance. And the fact that Yahuwah would even listen to that and actually oblige that, to me that that is just a huge testament to his mercy. Because at this point we're shown quite clearly he didn't have to. And if anything, he, he, we more than deserved destruction. But he didn't. And that's huge. Absolutely, sister. I, I agree. Um, I'm gonna I'm going to I'm going to piggyback on your on your statement there and, and, and talk about uh, uh, later um, to to your point that that I want to bring out something about Aaron that that um, mimics what you just said in regards to his mercy uh, in, in, you know in this passage so praise you for that um, brother Dean Sister Carmen. Hallelujah. Um, just um, I, 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 speaking about what the sister just said about uh, Yahuwah's mercy, um, mm. but what it also shows is if, you know, if his wrath is kindled to the point where he's ready to destroy, you know, um, the fact that he can make a decision not to do that because of the petition and, and uh, the faithfulness of one, um, that also shows that um, even for ourselves, um, who, who, who are called to, you know, who are made in his image and, and are called to, 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 to behave in, in that manner, there is, if, if he, who, you know, we, we, we cannot even fathom the level of, of despising and anger that, you know, that he has he felt. Or we, we just read these words, the, the, the scriptures, and we, we, look at how much he has done for, for us, you know, I, I won't even say for them, I'll say for us. And still, you know, we, we, it's one thing to forget, it's another thing to throw it back in his face. Yeah. Um, and the fact that his anger can be switched, it also shows a, 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 the level of control that he has um, and that he's not an emotional Elohim though he expresses compassion and emotions, he is not led by his emotions. Um, because yeah, that, 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 that's, that, that showed, that showed me that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to, to say that um, because yeah, even though he has a right, he, his right to avenge for him is not greater than his word and promise and covenant that he has made. So anything that reminds him um, justly of, of, of that covenant, he, you know, he will, he will listen to. He listens to his word, you know, so hallelujah. Praise God. I definitely am in agreement with what you said, you know, as far as petition. You know, <clears throat> in the same way that he was, you know, waiting to dispel his wrath, in the same way, he's he's waiting to, you know, dispel his blessings and 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 his mercy and his grace. Listen, and you know, we talked earlier about when he says "Hero Israel" and how that means for us to lean in, for us to give him ear, and for what we hear from our ears to to actually do. Listen, when we petition, 
He's waiting on to, to move on behalf of us. And when we pray and we see him move, then we're able to see that he didn't move until we spoke. And then he did it because we asked for it. You ask what you ask amiss. You know, when we ask, when our, when our, when our asking is on par with his will, when it's on par with, with, with his character, when it's on par and not missing the target of what he wants us to hit, he has to give it to us because his word says so, because his promises say so. And, and, and it's good for us to know and 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 there's a great reason to know, and 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 one of the main reasons to have a prayer journal to to see Yah move on behalf of us when we seek Him, when we pray, and we see those prayers answered. You know, we have to remember those things. Praise Yah. Um, so, great point, uh, Brother Dean. Um, I wanted to look at a few things, uh, kind of funny, uh, something that stood out to me when the sister was reading in verse 12. It says, then Yahuwah said to me, arise, go down quickly from here for your people whom you brought out of Egypt have acted corruptly. Listen, <laughs> you know you're in trouble when Yahuwah tells you your people, you know, it reminds me of, you know, um, when, when my wife has to tell me something about my son, you know, when it's, when it's something great, you know, look what my son did or look what our son did. Or, but when he's done something that needs to be checked, she says, your son, do you know what your son did? <laughs> you know, so this is what he's saying today. He said, yeah, Moses didn't lead him out. Yahuwah let him out. Moses was the catalyst for which he, he worked through, right? The people, your people, whom you brought, you know, so he's bringing attention to the rebellion from a humanistic standpoint. But he says, he says, they have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. So this is a, another regurgitation for them to remember not to fall away from his ways. And that word quickly means at once, in an instant, hastily, turn right after they, right after he's given them something. Right? Right after he's given them something. They 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 just got, you know, delivered. They're in the wilderness. They can't wait till Moses comes back down before they start doing what they're doing, you know? Quickly turned away and wanted an idol to worship, you know? Um, these are, these are you know, damning words, you know, but are one that Yahuwah wants them to understand and see and seek because of the possibility of them falling away and grabbing a hold to uh, a molding image that they're going to worship, just like we talked about in um, Psalm 15 and what Charles brought out in, 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 in Samuel. So, man, so much, so much is here. So much is here. Uh, what else do we see in, in these verses before we move on? Um, You know what? I'll continue to read and I'll pull out what I was what I was telling Sister Kala I wanted to come back to because it's it's interesting what happens in the next couple of verses. Look at look at verse 21, because this kind of continues on what she was saying about the grace and mercy of Aaron. It says, Then I took your sin, the calf which you had made, and turned it with fire and crushed it and ground it very small until I would, until it was as fine as dust. And I threw it, its dust, into the brook that descended from the mountains. Right? And, and when you think about that, you think about, I was thinking about 
you know, the grace and mercy that was bestowed upon Aaron and, and how he acted in, in, in on behalf when Moses prayed and looking at the two sides of that and really understanding, you know, I went back and I was reading Exodus, you know, during this account, right? Look what happens in Exodus 32. It says this in verse 24. Listen to this. It says, uh, <clears throat> now this is Aaron speaking, right? Let's start in verse 22. It says, this is chapter 32 of Exodus, starting in verse 22. It says, so Aaron said, do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. Um, you know the people that they are set on evil. For they said to me, make us gods that shall go before us. As for Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So remember, he's up on a the mountain. They're getting weary. They're getting uh, unsettled. They're grumbling. They're complaining. Um, they're, they're, they're impatient with the length of time it's taking him to come back down. And he says this in 24, he says, and I said to them, whoever has gold, let them break it off so that they gave it to me and I cast it into fire. And this calf came out. <laughs> you know what I mean? What a cockamamie story. You know what I mean? Oh, and this calf just popped out, you know, and this is what he takes to, to, to Moses, to, to, to take to Yah, you know, and we're talking about mercy and we're talking about grace. He becomes the father of the Levites. That, that, that hold close the Ark of the Covenant and, and through whom we have the sacrifices and the atonement through. Grace and mercy, even to the man that was partaking in this idolatry. You know, we talk about a whole family, a whole nation marked by sin and grace was bestowed upon them. So I wanted to bring that out because it married what, what uh, Kalal was saying earlier and also what Dean was talking about. And I wanted to bring that little story out because, man, you know, not only did you did you sin against Yah, you try to come up with the story like you just threw the gold and then a calf popped out. You know what I mean? No, y'all formed that. Y'all made that. Y'all molded that to be an Elohim formed in the same way that the Egyptians used to worship. This is something that you learn from them. You know, this isn't, you know, verse, verse 22, it continues. And you know, what's interesting about this is that Yah tells them and he's warning them about, you know, falling away. He's warning them that they're sniff necked and that they murmur. And then he said, oh, y'all don't believe me. Leave me. Let me, let me tell y'all, let me remind you guys of what you did. And that's what he's telling them right here. Verse 22, also at Tab Tabera and, Mas and Massah and at Kavroth Havata, you provoked Yahuwah to wrath, right? And we, we remember this from the murmuring from Numbers chapter 11, and this was the quail, right? Numbers chapter 11, um, verse 13 <clears throat> says, um, <clears throat> where am I to get meat to give to these people? For they weep all over me saying, give us meat that we may eat, right? And this, this is where they're murmuring and complaining and they're tired and sick and tired of the manna. And this is what he's pointing them to. This is when the quail come down, right? and provoke Yahuwah to wrath. Likewise, when Yahuwah um, sent you from Kadesh Barnea saying, go up and possess the land, which I give to you, then you rebelled against the commandment of Yahuwah, your, your, your Elohim, and you did not believe him nor obey his voice. You have been rebellious against Yahuwah. Listen to this, from the day that I knew you, like, I'm warning you about yourself and the capabilities of the place that your mind will put you in outside of my thinking. 
it's never good to be outside of Yahuwah's thinking, you know, and that can be difficult at times, but we're still charged to do it. We're still charged to transform, be, be transformed. How? By the renewing of our minds. And the renewing of our minds comes from the mind of Yah. All of the, the characteristics, all of the precepts have to do with the way he thinks. You know, our vision has to do with the way that he sees. What we hear and do has to do with what he's telling us and us adhering to what he's telling us. Man. Since the day that I knew you, verse 25, and this is where he goes in um, to the prayer. And this is what I was talking about with Brother Brian earlier, how um, Moses' prayer for the people mimics Daniel's prayer for the people when they were in captivity in Daniel chapter 9. You guys can read that on your own. But it says this, then I prostrated myself, therefore, uh, before a Yahuwah, 40 days and 40. So he goes back up, prostrates himself before Yahuwah, 40 days and 40 nights. I kept prostrating myself because Yahuwah had said he would destroy you. Therefore, I prayed to Yahuwah and said, Oh, Yahuwah Elohim, do not destroy your people and your inheritance <clears throat> whom you have redeemed. Right, and we talked about that word redeemed on uh, the Day of Atonement. It's the word meaning that a slave is purchased just to set free, purchased from their captivity just to be set free. Um, hold on one second. Sorry about that. So just to be purchased out of captivity, to be set free. That's what redeemed is. It says, inheritance you have redeemed through your greatness, whom you have brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do not look on the stubbornness of this people or on their wickedness of their sin, lest the land from which you brought us should say, because Yahuwah was not able to bring them to the land which he promised them, and because he hated them. He has brought them out to kill them in the wilderness. Yet they are your people and your inheritance, whom you brought out by your mighty power and your outstretched arm. So, Moses turns it back to Yah in his prayer and said, no, not the people that I let out, not the people that I, you know, um, use my power, but that you let out, Yahuwah, that your power, the power of your outstretched hand, Yahuwah can't deny that he protects the people um, as Moses put petitions to them. So we see these things come out um, awesomely. Um, <clears throat> Daniel chapter 9 um, has similar wording uh, <clears throat> in Daniel's prophecy. And this is prior to the to the prophecy, the 70-week prophecy. He, 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 he gives a prayer for the people. I'll read a couple of verses starting in verse three of chapter nine. This is Brian, this is what I was talking about earlier. It says, then I set my face toward, you, toward, toward Yahuwah Elohim, right? Same thing Moses said, I prostrated myself. To make requests by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to Yahuwah my Elohim and made confession and said, oh Yahuwah, great and awesome Elohim, who keeps his covenants and mercy with those who love him. That never changes. That can never change, you know. The fact that his 
his love never changed. The fact that his promises are never upset based upon his word, his covenants and mercy with those who, who, who love him and with those who keep his commandments, stipulations, right? We talk about parameters, statutes, his conditions, right? Um, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we headed, uh, uh, heeded, um, excuse me, heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to put our kings and our princes to our fathers and all the people of the land. O Yahuwah, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face as it is this day. And, and the prayer goes on. You guys can continue that. But I just wanted to show you how that mirrored Moses, um, not only Moses' posture, but Moses' position as the leader of the people, Daniel, uh, praying on behalf of his brothers and his sisters. So, man, what a chapter <clears throat> to go through and, uh, you know, just to be reminded of, you know, our history. Each and every one of us has a history with Yah, um, but we can mark <clears throat> days, rebellions, blessings, deliverance, all of those things, but those things are for our learning so we don't fall down that same path again. So praise you, Brother Brian. Brother Brian? Uh, yeah, just, yeah. Um, I, I had a question. Do you think, um, you mentioned the golden calf earlier. Uh, when they was worshiping the golden calf, do you believe that they were doing this, they thought it was pleasing to Yah, or did they, were they actually still worshiping another Elohim? Well, I, I think I think a couple things were going on there. Um, you know, when I read it, <clears throat> it, it, it looks to me like they want something that they can see. Um, they, they want something um, that is visible to them um, primarily because one, their leader was up in the mountain speaking to Yah, they knew he existed, but they didn't know what was going on with him. So they started to, they got, they got fearful. Um, so, so in their communication, they say they're, they're calling, they're calling this golden calf, which was, you know, you know, when we broke down the Elohims of, of, uh, of Egypt, there was one that represented the cattle and that's supposedly what they made this calf in the shape of. But what they did was they said that this calf that they built with their hands was the one that brought them out of Egypt. They, you know, were, 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 substituting this for Yahuwah because they, they didn't see the real Yahuwah. So, and, and what came with that is, was the, was the, the frolic, frolicking and the dancing and, you know, some of the rituals they were doing, you know, in, in, in front of this statue. So there was debauchery going on in regards to idolatry as well. So all of those things were happening in the face and at the base of the mountain where Moses was getting the instructions from Yah. So uh, that would draw nothing but wrath from Yahuwah. So I think a lot of those things, you know, the, the substitution because they couldn't see Yah, the, the distance between Moses and them for that period of time, them getting restless, them complaining, and then being disobedient all played into, into the sin uh, that they committed. Yeah, cause it's it's interesting because I it's like um coming to bring brought up in Christianity and stuff and I kind of see those same elements where it's not like the golden calf in that form but you see things that were that, that were kind of like brought over from paganism like the uh, 
the Christmas. And I remember I was going to the Pentecostal church years ago as a child, and we actually had Easter egg hunt after yeah. service. Yeah. And, and so like serious, like pagan origins mm -hmm. um, and stuff. And so it's like, I could see how like, how it's like, yeah, you want something tangible, I guess. Like, oh, uh, it, it, it tried to attribute something pagan to Yahuwah, but as sincere as you may be, it's like, it's just totally just wrong. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's very, very important that, that we understand that <clears throat> the whole of scripture is about his way, not what we conjure up as, as the way that we think that he's saying, but what he is saying, you know. There's a million commentaries on what people think the Bible is saying that are not what the Bible is saying. You know what I mean? So that trick of the enemy is very prevalent, you know, throughout, you know, the faith. And, and we have to be careful of that. So just like the Israelites, it can happen to us, you know, if we're not careful. Praise God. Well, um, next week we can go into uh, ne next week. Yeah, next week um, we should be going into uh, chapter ten, um, the second the, the 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 second set of tablets. Um, so read ahead, um, brother Dean, uh, like brother Dean, so that you uh, have your insight and questions. Uh, it just makes the conversation better, you know, as we continue to go through scripture and and learn exactly what Yahuwah is telling us. Um, and leave no doubt, you know, um, we we learn together, we come to conclusions together. <clears throat> you know, one of the things that I always try to do, you know, is have a base, have a clear understanding going in, but also be open to have my understanding changed, you know, if it can be proven. And, you know, that is something that we always have to do when we study together, Brother Charles. Yeah, praise um, I don't know. I, I'm I'm thinking it's a correlation, like with the cattle and um, and what I read earlier. It's in um, Isaiah 46, one and two. Um, it says, "Bill bows down, Nebo stoops. Their idols were on the beast and on the cattle. Your carriages, you're heavily loaded. Your carriages were heavily loaded, a burden to the weary beast." They stoop, they bow down together. They could not deliver the burden, but have themselves gone into captivity. So I uh, want to mention that. And uh, one more thing, can I mention uh, earlier, uh, earlier when we were talking about the, um, the other study, when you look at a dog, like a dog is, is already on all fours. It's, it's, it's already low, ready to bow down to something. You know, it just you know a dog wants to wants just wants a master, so it's already low. And when the dog sits down, his his back legs are bent like how we prostrate if we get on our knees, and our and they they front front legs are out like how we do, except that they can't stretch them out the way we do. But it's all like in the letter Y, but we all prostrate ourselves the same, just like a dog and an animal. So. Uh, kind of what I want to say, so praise y'all. Praise y'all. <clears throat> Following up on this morning's um, message, um, praise y'all. And just to recap on this morning, you know, one of the things we have to remember when we're when we're reading the Brit Hadashah is that, you know, Yahushua spoke in parables. You know, even the simplest things were in parables. What he said to the woman was was in the form of a parable. But the truth of her response let him know that she understood. You know, and we had a lot of conversation about dogs and whether it was a dog or a puppy. And I, and I showed you the differences between the two words. And be, being more of an endearing term, which meaning that it wasn't outside of receiving, but that there was an order. 
the reason that you don't see him say the same thing in Mark as you see in um, Matthew doesn't mean that he didn't say it. He said the same thing. You know, I come not for the lost sheep of Israel, but in Mark he says, you know, let let the let the children eat first uh, before you feed the little dogs, the little puppies. It's the same thing. The point was, there is an order to which my mission comes. And once, once he knew that she understood that, he knew that she was a woman of faith and was able to grant her request. So we always have to make sure we're understanding that Yahushua speaks in a parable form for a clearer understanding to reach those who truly love, trust, follow, and have faith in him, and that everyone else is cast out. Because they're always looking for traps and holes. And just like the, you know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they weren't coming to, to get more healing. They were coming to point a finger at him, point a blame, find something wrong with what he was saying. Um, and it was always incorrect. So just wanted to kind of we circle back to that. Well, praise y'all. Thank you guys for hanging around and uh, sticking in there with the study. Uh, but this concludes our, our chapter nine of Deuteronomy study. We'll pick up next time we're together in chapter 10. Um, so praise y'all and uh, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Toto Roba. Praise Abba Yah from whom all Baraka flow. We hope this video encouraged you today. Don't forget to study to show yourself approved and be like the Bereans who tested everything. According to 2 Timothy 3.15 and Acts 17.11, we assemble every Shabbat and during the week with like-minded believers all over the world, virtually, and sometimes we gather in person for feast days. We have something for the whole family, including children. Discover more on our website at assemblyofyahuwah.com where you can apply to join, give the biblical assembly needs, and find many biblical resources to help you grow in your walk with Yah. To know when we publish new videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Jeremiah 33 3 tells us, call to Yahuwah and he will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Much alone.